division. So pride gets in the way. They should have listened to God. What what had God promised to Jeroboam? Rule over his heart, all his heart desired, and if he obeyed, he would make his house like David's house. There's this problem, or there's this promise that if he obeys, he's going to be a king like David. That's the idea, right? He has the promise. Maybe pride gets in the way. What else may have gotten in his way of doing the right thing here? Fear. Fear. Maybe the question is, what, what should he have done? I don't know if that's the right question or not. We'll see him do it later, but he should have consulted Abijah, you know, the prophet who had promised this to him. Yeah, so he, he obviously did not go to God to seek counsel. Very different uh, story here than uh, we've seen before. Some of the righteous leaders we've looked at. Um, as we move into chapter 13 with the story of the man of God here, uh, what, what stands out to you about this story in chapter 13? End up meaning that this is one of those occasions where we just encounter this person that comes on the scene momentarily, and at least it's, it's reported in the Bible. But it's significant in that this has been preserved for us for all these thousands of years to read and understand, but uh, it really emphasizes to me that this whole story is about God's relationship with his people. It's not necessarily about all these particular individuals and answering our questions about their background and life and the things we might be interested in. Yeah. When, when we, oh, Matthew? It, it seems almost unfair what happens to this man of God. He was deceived by you know, this other prophet, and uh, he pays the price for it, and the other prophet doesn't. But what's interesting is, you know, at the end of it, in verse 33, after this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again, he made priests from every class of people for the high places, and so on. So it sounds like this is directed toward Jeroboam, and the message here is exactly what we were talking about. Just because you took you somebody else told you to do it because you got bad advice doesn't absolve you from disobeying what the Lord has told you to do. Yeah, no, that's that's a that's a good comment there about the way this is recorded. Uh, it does seem that Jeroboam seems to be aware of this event. At least that's how I read it. Uh, so there seems to be a message there for Jeroboam. Uh, I think that's a good, a good point, Matthew, and something to think about is what what sin did the man of God here really commit? You're to say this is what he did wrong. God's God's counsel. I mean, he he disobeyed God, but when God gives a clear instruction, and then a man tells you something other than what God has already told you, uh, you better have clear evidence that God changed his mind. It's not enough just to take somebody's word for it. Yeah, I mean, and I, I put myself in this man of God's place, right? If you put yourself in that position, and it, it seems to be an older man of God, an older prophet comes, and he says, hey, here's, here's this change God's changed his mind he's he's gonna allow you to come he's revealed he revealed that to you but he's revealed this to me you know it's, it's almost like okay you know you, you can almost see pretty easily why he thought maybe that was the right thing but obviously he had been directly told by God this is what you're supposed to do 
it's not up to a man, regardless of what this other man says happened, to to be the authority to change what God had said. So maybe the fail, fail, failure to consult God, to, to uh, check, you know, check it with God. Hey, by the way, it's what he's saying right. If we look at the beginning of chapter 13 versus the end of chapter 13, we have this scene with Jeroboam. Uh, the king answers the man in in this. He, he reaches out to the man. Uh, it says that uh, his hand withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. And there's this great sign. Um, then the king answered in verse 6 and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Uh, in verse 7, then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. It's interesting, even with an evil king like Jeroboam, who's turned so much, he has acknowledged God. He acknowledges the Lord. He's so knows who the Lord is. He knows it's the power of the Lord. Why does Jeroboam not change? It's just speculation, obviously. I guess we have the clear, here's the answer. Why do you think Jeroboam doesn't change? Probably the same things that led him to build the high places, you know, in the first place, control. He wanted what he wanted. It didn't matter if he acknowledged God or not. He wanted what he wanted. Yeah. So, other thing that I just thought was interesting about this story. Why do you think it was that the man of God who was deceived was the one who was punished? We don't read about the punishment of the deceiver. It's unfair, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, those are just, I mean, I don't think there's a good answer, Matthew. What do you yeah, think? I think this goes back to the message for Jeroboam. Yeah. yeah, Jeroboam is the person who's letting himself be deceived. Sure. And he's going to pay the, the consequences for it. It's not so much in the message for his advisors. Yeah. The message is to Jeroboam. I like, I like that thought. I think it also speaks to, <clears throat> excuse me, how differently God, <clears throat> excuse me, how differently God views our lives and our death compared to how we view them as human beings. Uh, you know, this man, the man that deceived the young man, he's he says in verse 31, when I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. You know, he lived out the rest of his life remembering what he did that caused his younger, younger man's death. So you know, there's a degree of punishment with that, but there's also the eternal state of man that's far more consequential. So I'm not going to try to comment on what that was for sure. either one of these men. It's just from God's viewpoint, that's far more consequential than whether we live on the earth very long or not. Sure. We move into this week's reading, starting 1 Kings 14 through the end of the book, and then 2 Kings 1 through 3. Um, what things you know, what things do we read about? What things what things stood out to you guys as, as you read through these stories here? They relate to all the chapters of yeah as we move into this week's reading starting in 14. And look at the corresponding account of Second Chronicles, which is it seems like the, the priests of Levi Saul came down to Judah. So, uh, they didn't like what Jeroboam did, so they kind of so for a period of years. Things were really, really good. So they decided not to listen to the prophets, the prophets and they did go attack Israel, the ten tribes. Uh, things really were good. Uh, and then about year five, they stopped. Uh, and notes that they, there was a change in how they were going. 
trusted the Lord. That's when she shot came in and uh, took everything away. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Took all the gold shields, so he would go and make some bronze shields. And then even when he goes in, they got they uh, put him under lock and key, I guess, or something. <laughs> like, some poor schmo has to go take his bronze shield back and forth whenever the king comes into the into the tower. It's kind of a uh, kind of pathetic, actually. Yeah, it seems symbolic too, right? You know, we have this great kingdom under Solomon from a from a purely fleshly perspective, right? We look at the kingdom and it's great because of all the things that they've done. They have this beautiful ornate temple and all this gold everywhere and these gold shields and all this treasure. And so while it is a fleshly thing to look at, it's because they had been blessed by God, right? And if we see the kingdoms divided and they're turning from God, that's taken from them. And it's replaced. They're like, okay, well, we still need shields, right? Like, got to look look the part. So they make bronze shields. They're just the symbolism there, right? Like, it, it's, it's not the same. It's not as costly. It's not as beautiful. It's, it's, it's just... Well, this is what we got. It's just it's very symbolic, I think, of what's happening here in the kingdom at this time. What else stands out to you? You got a lot of kings, so I mean we should spend a lot of time going through it, but the cycle of the king, bad king, side of king. Almost like reading the judges again, <laughs> in a way, right? If you look in chapter 15, even, see there's judgment back on the house of Jeroboam in chapter 14. Uh, Jeroboam's dead. We read of Prehoboam's reign. And we get a Bijum in Judah. We read about, you know, just a little bit about him, a little bit about Asa. Uh, I did think this was interesting, though. Is As you read through, you see in verse is, let's see, um, 11. Let's check 15, verse 11. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. That's a statement. We're, we're good with that statement. He did as David did. Here's how he did that. He banished the perverted persons from the land, removed all the, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Also, he removed... Uh, Make uh, his grandmother from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah, and Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. Seems like he's doing a lot of good things. And but the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. <clears throat> Reading through that but statement, it's like, hold on, <laughs> you know. If, if we just took that statement out, everything that Ace has done seems really, really good, right? Like he's, he's done, walked in the ways of David. He's, he's clearing the land of idolatry and this evil religious practice that they're talking about. Uh, if he even gets, uh, you know, his hands dirty in his own family here, cleaning things up there. And then it finishes by saying his heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. But in the middle of that, what's the one thing he didn't do? The high places remain. I don't know if that's there is kind of like the mark against them. Hey, well, why do you think that statement's there? How about that? Let's do that. So, why do you think that statement's there? It shows kind of the degree of of loyalty to the Lord, like we'll see a couple of kings later who are really good kings, Hezekiah and Josiah. And one of the things that sets them apart is they get rid of those high places. Um, you, you also said everything else in the truth. We do see you know, later in his life, he's trusting in uh, Syria rather than in the Lord to get rid of. Um, the Israelite presence on his border, and Basha, king of Israel, and so he trusts in Syria, and not only is he trusting him, he's 
taking all the money out of the temple in order to do that. Sure. Yeah, no, there's maybe some some discussion there for sure about the the right or wrong of that too. Any other ideas about the high places? Do you think it's an indication <clears throat> that even though the leadership, in this case King Asa, was loyal to God, but the people's heart was not fully with God doing his will? I, I was thinking about that chapter 22 of 1 Kings when Asa son Jehoshaphat was king it says that he walked in all the ways of his father Asa and he did not turn aside from him doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord nevertheless the high places were not taken away for the people offered sacrifices and burnt offering no, excuse me burnt incense burned incense on the high places and then later on in 2 Kings chapter 12 you see the same thing with Joash Jehoash um, seems like excuse me seems like that uh, Regardless, there's times, I guess, when one individual may be pursuing the right ways, but the people are still inclined to go about their own own way. So, I'm understanding you're you're suggesting maybe there's kind of a disconnect between what the leadership's doing. The leadership seems to be doing what's right. He's pursuing the good things, but the people are kind of the I'm pulls saying, out on this, maybe. Yeah. I'm not saying that the king didn't have authority to remove the high places. Sure. I just mean that the uh, indication is that the people were very willing and desiring to continue to offer these sacrifices on high places. Yeah. No, I was I'm glad you went to First Kings 22. I was thinking about that as well. Richard, do you have something? Oh, I just think it's interesting. And what a difficult thing it was to get rid of idolatry. That God told them from the very beginning, you gotta get rid of these people because you're gonna be you're gonna, you're gonna be influenced by them. But their method of worship is unacceptable to me. Yeah, I'm your God. He, uh, everything that we read about how He took care of them, and today, do we have idols in our life? Do we have things that we? put before the Lord things that we can't get out of our lives to give our hearts fully to God. So it's not there for us just to criticize them. Oh yeah. It's there for us to look into and observe and look into the mirror of the law of liberty about correction. Because it's real easy to to uh, criticize them. But I just find it interesting that they could not get rid of the high places. Oh, yeah. I think this also speaks to the our traditions. You know, like uh, faces getting rid of things that are obviously wrong, the word of person, idols, uh, this obscene image, and this queen mother. But the high places, oh, they've always done that. They've done that for a long time. Their parents did that. You know, and then we see the same thing on the Israelite side. You know, Baal will come, they'll get rid of Baal, but they never get rid of the golden calves and the high places and, or, and the worshiping at Bethel and Dan. They contain, for every king, pretty much, it says, he continued in the sin of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, um, but they keep making this same mistake. <laughs> Even like Jehu, who purges uh, Baal worship from the land, he doesn't go all the way back. He gets stuck up with you know, what they've done traditionally. Sure. Isn't it with King Hezekiah that they read the law and that's why like, they hadn't had the law and then he has it read before them and then he goes through and does all of this? I don't remember for sure, but... <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, this, Allie and I were talking about that, and uh, I can't recall off the top of my head if uh, y'all may know, did we read it when the law was lost? No, but there was about 80 years in between Hezekiah and Josiah that apparently somewhere in there. 
But clearly, throughout this whole period of history, the law becomes less and less important to them. Uh, you know, there's laws about the king and their relationship with the law and how they're to know the law and uh, the people and the reading of the law and the offering of sacrifices that, that clearly becomes less and less of a priority for them as we progress through the kingdoms. Uh, it, it is later in the history that there's the actual losing of the law and finding it and reading of it. Uh, here at this point, you know, thinking about these high places, uh, kind of anchored in here because this is going to be, uh, this is the theme of Israel really through the through the judges, through the kings. Idolatry has been the thing that has just come up time and time again. Um, some lessons have been brought up, right? Some applications for us, but what what lessons do we take away from this? I think about we read of a king Asa here who he he's loyal to God, all of these, you know, good, godly things that he's doing, but he doesn't remove the high places. To me, one of the lessons I read is is we got to be really careful about what we keep around us because it is, it's just a little while later, uh, we're reading in uh, in in chapter 22 that the high places are still there. And while the king is loyal to God, the people are worshiping on the high places again. To me, there's almost a change in narration. Like here, the high place is just left there. It's not destroyed by 1 Kings 22. They're back to worship. Or maybe there's a lesson in what we keep close to us, you know, don't really rid out of our lives. But what other lessons or principles do you know about the high places to like look at that? Like so. Is that something you think about the people that have gone up in the mountains and they're offering sacrifice or putting the altar together with the Jew box? Was it was it something it didn't seem like there was something grand or made? It was just like it boosts up together for the sacrifice. So I don't even know that, you know, how could a king, how could the simple government make sure that none of the people, hundreds of thousands of people, actually go and do that? So I think of it more as a reflection of the people. Not so much a reflection of the king, sure. Uh, and I don't know if that's right or wrong. It's just I just like how do how do you stamp that? Out? Yeah. People want to if the people want to go do that. If they're gonna you know, walk up some mountain trail and, and offer sacrifice or light some incense, how is the king going to stop that? People, it's the people that are evil, sure. Come. There's the sermon side of that in Second Chronicles 14, verse 3. We're talking about Ace said, He removed the altars of the dead gods and the high places and broke down the sacred pillars. He cut down the wooden images. So there was probably some structure. There was some structure up there that was significant to the people making the sacrifices. But he, he did that, but that said that the people still went and sacrificed in that place. So it's like that's really maybe, maybe or yeah, like I said, maybe it wasn't like maybe you cut down all the things that were obvious. <laughs> you can't stop them. I think there's also an element here of the who they're worshiping at the high places. In some places they're worshiping the Lord, and then later we'll see they start worshiping idols there. Well, Solomon introduced that too, or not idols, other gods there, and Solomon introduced that too. And I think you know some of these times when it talks about nevertheless the high places remain they're destroying anything used for worshiping other gods there, but they're allowing the worship of the Lord to continue at the high places. It also to me speaks to the fact that we can do a lot of things to put certain things out of our heart pursuit of things that are deemed by men to be completely wicked, but it also speaks to the fact that God does care about the way we worship Him. It's not, you know, it's not just that we should acknowledge Him as God, that we should worship Him and claim to worship Him in whatever way we see fit, but God apparently at this time cared how these men worshiped Him, otherwise He wouldn't have reported this yeah. for us to read today. I think there's something to be said about 
trusting God and like his ways are not our ways. And so it was all started because Jeroboam was afraid that if they continued to go back and worship and sacrifice in Judah, that the people would turn back to the house of David. <clears throat> but God had promised him that if you're faithful to me, I'm going to make your kingdom great. So it's just, it's easy for us to fall into those patterns too when we don't understand why God tells us to do something and it may not make sense to us that it's still going to work out because he's in control if we just obey him. And it may not work out the way we think it will. Like even David, who went through the whole period of Saul chasing him and all of this while he's faithful, but God still provided ways of escape from so. Uh, it just his ways are not ours. Yeah. yeah, it is interesting that you know it's the same problem in Israel and Judah. Both it's both idolatry, it's both high place worship. Now he says here in Judah they're doing the same sinning in the same way as the people in the north, and they have the temple. You know they have Jerusalem. They it, it, you know, they just there's just that general turning away from God. There's guess something better the grass is green or something some reason uh that they've decided that idolatry is well, i say some reason like you said richard it's easy to look and condemn but you know we we have the same things maybe not uh the same type of images that they bow down to in our lives today but certainly uh similar things operate in our lives like idols too i guess as we move forward through the reading we could anchor down here for a while we read through several kings in the end of chapter 15 and chapter 16, kind of uh, just kind of one right after the other. Um, we get to Ahab. Um, anything in chapter 15, 16 that you want to pause and talk about? Otherwise, we'll keep moving. Your point the, seems significant to me that 15, 16, we just read these very short little synopsis of these men's lives and then we get to Ahab and God sends a prophet of significant men that we read about in the Bible uh, in the middle of Ahab's reign and you have to stop or at least I did it makes me stop and think about why why is that yeah that, that was something uh, that was interesting as well because I thought the same sort of thing is we read through Sometimes it is, it's just so fast, so brief, but we're covering, you know, just, just a decent period of history. If we look at just these chapters here in chapter 15, uh, just in Israel, you know, we're reading from, what's this, this like 910 all the way to 874. So you know, that's what, 35 years or so maybe that we're looking at of history that's summed up in just a handful of verses. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. We're like on the seventh king here, and, and we're gone through 35 years of history, and we have not even two full chapters dedicated to this period. There's not a lot of discourse about what God's interaction is with the people. There's not a lot of information. It's just the people were evil. Now we get to Ahab. In the end of chapter 16, how evil was Ahab? It's the worst. It's the worst. I kind of read this, and maybe I'm reading into it, I don't know, but I kind of read this almost as like, if you think about all the ways that all of the kings before him were evil, and you put all that together, he was even more evil than that. I mean, it's almost like this summation point, just this great climax of evilness that's here in Israel now. It's It's pretty terrible. We read about Ahab, and in short order, we see Elijah come on the scene here in chapter 17. How, how's Elijah introduced here? I love the nickname that Ahab gives Elijah. Yeah. No trouble. No trouble of Israel. Yeah. He calls him a couple of times. So what makes him a troubler of Israel? Elijah's telling the truth. He's a man of God and speaking God's judgment. So, kind of, that sets the stage for this incredible showdown between the prophets of Baal and his work. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, 
the troubler of Israel, uh, Elijah's response to that, pretty bold. I, you know, I, I look at some of these stories with people like Elijah and uh, even um, Obadiah before this. Uh, it's like, man, would, would I have been in Obadiah? Would I have been in Elijah? It's, 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 it's very awesome to think about the confidence and the boldness these men have in some of these situation when when Elijah is called a troubler of Israel he answered I have not troubled Israel but you and your father's house have in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals really interesting like you see this in conflict today there's people who will resort to you know name calling and mudslinging and just trying to put other people down and that's really all Ahab's trying to do oh troubler of Israel and he's just He's just trying to throw something at Elijah and see what sticks, right? He he sees it this way. Elijah says, you know, okay, I, I haven't troubled Israel, though. That, that's you, and here's why. And we think about all the evil things that are happening in the nation at this time. Uh, we go back to the beginning of the text here in chapter 18, and we read about Obadiah. Who was Obadiah? Or the Baal's house. So he's in charge of Ahab's house. So Ahab, like the most evil king in all of Israel, Obadiah is in charge of his house. But what does Obadiah do? He preserves, preserves and hides these prophets. He, he delivers them from death is really what he's doing, right? Uh, I think the story just before the troubler of Israel comments really interesting when Obadiah meets Elijah. And Elijah tells him to go back to the king. Uh, why is Obadiah so willing to hide the prophets? He does this, risks his life here. But now in this situation with Elijah, he's afraid to do what Elijah does or tells him to do. Why? not be there when he came back and they had would kill him he's afraid for his life now it's just an interesting you know we read this statement here at the beginning and very obviously his life would have been in danger fighting these prophets in this time and we get to this story here you know who knows how much time's happened who knows what influence the house has had on him i don't know but now he's being addressed with elijah Elijah tells him to go to the king. You're going to meet Elijah. You can tell the king that, that Elijah, that he's going to be at this place. So Beth says, whoa, whoa, hold on. <laughs> Don't do that. He's going to kill me. You might not be here. You know, the Lord's going to take you. Like, okay. You know, he, he has this uh, little qualm here with himself. He's afraid now. Uh, we get to the troubler of Israel comment. I like that section a lot. And we get to Mount Carmel. Uh, very cool encounter here. Um Inter anything that you want to stop and discuss in, in this encounter? It's just one of the greatest stories in the Old Testament. It's just the whole setup for it uh, and how uh, God ultimately uh, is victorious and shows his power to all people and how much rules the other priests make of themselves. Uh, there's humor involved. <laughs> Yeah, when we get to the end of the story, uh, in verse 38, and the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it looked at the water that was in the trench. So it's a pretty impressive display. God's response to Elijah's prayer here. Uh, now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. So it's an impressive display that was not only impressive, but effective. The people responded appropriately, right? The Lord, he is God. They're acknowledging, okay, th this is it. And Elijah has them arrest the prophets of Baal, to seize them. How many prophets? So we have we have the 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 um, 400, 450 um, 
that are seized, and Elijah seems to be, you know, the one to roll up his sleeves here and kill him. That's it's a pretty uh Elijah's amazing. Yeah. Man God. Just be tired of bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of what I'm thinking here. How long does that take? You know, it's just it's a it's quite the story. Just those two verses there, three verses at the end. And the story about the ending of the drought uh, at the very end of chapter 18. Some interesting uh, pictures talked about here. Uh, anything stand out to you at the end of chapter 18? You want to stop and talk about? It stands out to me that Elijah poured all that water on top of the sacrifice right in the middle of the drought that had been going on for so long that God, you know, by his power, licks up the water with that fire, and now the drought's about to come to an end, but it's only by the power of God that that happens. I haven't even thought about that. It's in the middle of the drought that this happens. I'm sure that probably felt like quite the waste of water to everybody, right? So probably in the conservation mindset here, you can just pour it on the altar. Then it's gone. <laughs> that is uh, interesting. I haven't thought about that. So the drought ends. Uh, we have this scene where Elijah outruns the chariot here uh, with Ahab on it. It's just real. Uh, we get to chapter 19. Elijah. Uh, this is a really interesting story in chapter 19 uh, with Elijah fleeing Jezebel. What stands out to you in chapter 19? How about this? Coming off the hills of chapter 18 is Mount Carmel victory in the end of the drought. And now we're faced with Jezebel. Why do you think Elijah felt so overwhelmed at this point now? Oh, I always thought that was odd. <laughs> I have no idea why he felt that way, but just after what he was in the middle of and witnessed, why was he afraid of her? I wonder if this is an example of a good person becoming weary and doing good. Mm -hmm. The Bible warns us against becoming weary and doing mm -hmm. things. And Elijah certainly felt alone and it seems like he's he's become weary. That that loneliness, I think, is key to this story that he's talking about. He he sees the Jezebel has been effective in killing the prophets. They he comes off Mount Carmel, and how many people were there praying for the fire? It was him. He, he was alone. So it is an impressive display. And we do see people respond, seeming seem to respond appropriately. But it's right after that that it's almost like this all catches up to him. Like I'm the only one. And that loneliness, I think, is what drives the emotions that he feels here. Um, I, I heard Ben talk about this, and so you can imagine what Ben pointed out. Uh, the angel fed him. He ate. Uh, that's important. <laughs> heard him talk about that a couple times, but it is it is interesting, though, that uh, you know the angel comes, he provides him food, has him rest, um, but he provides him food, and then uh, and then what? He rested some more. And God's to him. Yeah. I think verse 8 is interesting. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as far as the mountain of God. So he goes. He has this interaction with God. He's shown that he's not alone. Um, we're going to see through the end of our reading through the week, Elisha comes on the scene, joins Elijah. Uh, there's some stories of Ahab uh, defeating the Syrians. I think it's interesting. God even provides an evil king uh, victory. He provides them the opportunity to do the right things. Uh, we have the story of Naboth. I'm not going to spend time on that because we went through that uh, in our gospel meeting. Uh, we get to Ahab here towards the end of his life. And he's condemned. There's two different passages where it talks about Ahab being condemned. But Ahab, even Ahab, humbles himself to the point 
that God promises to not take the kingdom from him until after he's dead. It's interesting that even in a man like Ahab, God is patient and merciful and gracious with. Let's uh, plan to pick up right at the beginning of 2 Kings next week with Ahaziah. Yeah,